Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the, um, the running schedule has changed a bit, and I was going to be at the end, and I'm now after Serge. And Serge, obviously, is a proper scientist. Um, but I'm going to try and talk about sex and evolution from a non-scientist's <laughs> point of view. So I'm probably going to look a complete idiot now, whereas if you were later on in the afternoon, you would have forgotten all about the wonderful Serge presentation. So, um, I'm going to talk about um, innovation. And um, the title, therefore, Why Brands Need Sex, is, is all about how do brands innovate. In fact, not just brands, but businesses, organisations, um, and indeed us. How, how do we change? And um, you probably would have seen um, on the, um, the schedule that you know, originally I was in the advertising world, the, the old advertising world, where uh, you know, we used to do things called TV commercials and radio commercials. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, that is the old world, and we're increasingly becoming the old world. So we all have to reinvent ourselves, otherwise we sort of get stuck in cul-de-sacs. So, um, so it's all about innovation. I've talked about it on the basis of brands, but it can apply to anything. Uh, and also, I'm going to talk a little bit about things called agile methodologies, which is the way that we work um, in the digital world. Not everybody does, but it's the way that we work. And um, an agile is a way of working uh, which you're doing things really very quickly. You're doing things called iterative sprints. You're, you're not working in a sequential way, which is the way that most people work, which is you, you have a goal somewhere in the, in the future, and you do things step by step. And you start with step one, you finish that, you go to step two, and then eventually um, you get to what your ultimate goal is. Agile isn't about that. It's much more of a sort of a cyclical, just getting things done type of, of process. <clears throat> so, innovation in the modern world, in the modern world, I think is has to be done in an agile way. And ultimately, I'm going to come and show you uh, how we do that. So, um, innovate or die. We all know about that. We're told that all the time. In fact, this is uh, from, from Google. Brands need to innovate, we all need to innovate, otherwise um, we're going to fall off uh, the edge of the world. And actually, the great thing about um, coming immediately after search is that, in fact, this whole notion of a set of individuals not having a lot of money, having this wonderful idea of, oh, why don't we build a drone, going on the web, finding out how to do it, spending less than 650 quid or whatever, is actually all about what I want to talk about. In fact, it's a wonderful example. So actually, it's sort of like Serge has sort of created one bookend, and ultimately I'll sort of come on to another example as, uh, as, as the second bookend. So it's all about innovation. It's all about you've got to do that or die, but it's about the way that we, that we do it. And, and evolution, the theories of evolution, actually um, gives us some sort of framework that we can apply to the way that we should be innovating today. So can you see it standing in front of you? Whoops. Um, so in terms of uh, the journey, um, I'm also looking at this as, as a bit of an anti-journey, as I said. So it's, it's not working in this sort of sequential way, um, where we start here, there's a well-marked path, and we know where we're going to get to. I mean, evolution isn't really like that at all. I mean, evolution doesn't know anything about the future. Evolution is something which happens in a very random way. Now, we always sort of think of, of evolution as being something which is almost predetermined. We think it goes in steps. You know, we, we all know, you know that graphic of sort of you know, the, the chimpanzee or the monkey going to the chimpanzee, you know, eventually coming to man, as if, you know, which sort of is supposedly encapsulates evolution. But actually, evolution isn't like that at all. It's, it, it, it doesn't have a part which is why it's an, an anti-journey. It doesn't start out with a goal in, in mind at all. Um, it's just, as I said, it's completely random. It's just happening all the time. And I'm going to come on a little bit about that in a minute. So, so evolution is, is, is the anti-journey. Mind you, having said that, you could be like the, sort of the sealer camp or whatever, and you can sort of, you know, actually stay the same for millions of years. Evolution can also sort of send you off down a cul-de-sac as, as well. So again, one should always be thinking that in this sort of very random world, 
it's actually incredibly difficult to be able to say, oh, I know what the future is going to be. I know that if I do this, this is going to create success. That really is the very old way of thinking. The, old, the whole way of doing agile is that you actually just do stuff. And by doing stuff, you see whether it works or not. And you don't care if it doesn't work. You just do it. And then you're learning all the time. So um, we've got the anti-journey there. So evolution in this completely random way. Um, but you have to keep doing it. And um, <coughs> there is a theory. Um, of, which has sort of come out about the way that evolution works um, by a chap called Lee Van Valen um, back in the 1970s. Um, and that's called the Red Queen Theory. And um, it's a theory which is using a quote from <coughs> Alice through the, uh, through the Looking Glass uh, where the Red Queen says to Alice, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. In other words, even if you run fast, you're not really going to get very much further than where you are at the moment. And there's a very good point to that within the story of Alice uh, through the looking glass. But the point about what that means in terms of innovation is that unless you're doing innovation all the time, unless you're running all the time, um, you're actually not even going to stay in the same place. You're going to be falling behind. And I think today we can think of all sorts of organisations who and brands who clearly don't have this process and belief in terms of running all the time. I mean, take somebody like Microsoft. I mean, they certainly don't run. I mean, their sprints are <laughs> marathons, and by the time they complete the marathon, another marathon has already started and has possibly finished. And that's the whole point about doing things fast, as opposed to sort of saying, well, we we'll take three or four years to sort of come up with a new um, operating system or whatever, which in any case is not a very good operating system in the first place, but by the time it gets into the marketplace, it's, it's already redundant. So we've got to keep running all the time, and that's because our environment is infinitely variable and infinitely dynamic and it's changing all the time. I mean as I was saying, it's, it's not something which is still, it's not something that you can predict. Um, everything that we do um, is within, uh, within an environment that you didn't know about, I mean, which is what I was saying earlier. I mean I didn't know I was going to be on second, I thought I was going to be on second to last. Um, and so, you know, it's all this unexpectedness that you've got to be able to relate to. Now, sex, so I wasn't just being gratuitous when I had that in the, in the title. Um, sex is the way, of course, that we shake everything up as species. In other words, what we're trying to do is to constantly recreate our DNA. And it's by recreating our DNA that we're able to exist in some form or another within whatever the environment is that we happen to live in at the moment. And most of the time, <coughs> the thing that actually is a real problem for us are things called germs. And we know all about germs, and we know how germs are constantly mutating. And life is all about this constant mutation. So you've got things mutating over there, things mutating over here. I'm trying to mutate to sort of stop those nasty germy things who are mutating. Um, trying to um, <coughs> uh, kill me, because that's what germs want to do, basically. So you've got this constant process of active mutation all the time. Um, neither of us can predict, none of us can predict what the next mutation is going to be. So that's the whole point about innovation. You can't predict. That's why futurologists are a complete and utter waste of time. And I was reading this morning, um, the old company that I was working for has just created this huge digital monolith between Digitas and, and LBI. And Morris Levy, who's the head of the company, was saying, but well, that means we'll be able to better predict the future. We can't predict the future. And if what you're trying to do all the time is to say, well, I can see what the future is, and so therefore this is the path that I have to get to, um, you're just completely <coughs> wasting your time. What you should be doing is just doing stuff now. Oops. <coughs> Now, the rather interesting thing here, I'm going to read something out, actually, because I want to get the quote right, is the <coughs> Red Queen theory. Um, there's something which, I, in fact, I came across, did come across many, many years ago, 
But up until recently, um, it actually was only a theory. But in Liverpool, not at John Moores, but at the University of Liverpool, they have just proven that the theory is actually right. And um, <clears throat> the way they did it, and I'm just going to read this out, is we used fast evolving viruses so that we could observe hundreds of generations of evolution. We found that for every viral strategy of attack, the bacteria would adapt to defend itself, which triggered an endless cycle of co-evolutionary change. So again, I really like that sort of, that, that, that phrase, endless cycle of co-evolutionary change. So you keep doing it, it's a cycle, you keep moving forward, you're constantly changing, but actually so is everybody else constantly changing. So you can never sort of sit back, put your feet up, and say that the job is done. In fact, it's rather interesting, the other day I was having um, lunch with somebody, <coughs> and, uh, and they said, you know, why, why are websites so bad? Why are they so boring? And the answer is, uh, of course, every website, but, um, <coughs> but the answer is, is because what happens is people do, and then they say, oh, I've done the job. I can now sort of sit back and move on to something else. Um, and that's all they do. And they just wait. And then perhaps in three or four years' time, somebody says, well, you know what? You know, maybe we should update our website. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. And then they start going through that process all over again. So it's not big changes that lead to survival, but lots of little changes. And um, <clears throat> Again, that's this whole point about doing a lot of things all the time. In fact, and I'm going to read it out again, because when I'm quoting science, and I've certainly know that Serge is over there, I never want to uh, get it absolutely wrong. Um, there's a guy called Bill Hamilton, a uh, scientist in the US, who said, one explanation of sex is that it stores genes that are currently bad, but have promised for reuse. It continually tries them in combination waiting for the time when the focus of disadvantage has moved elsewhere. So that's an amazing thing, isn't it? It's actually keeping the things which are bad. So at some stage in the future, there's possibly, or even probably, going to be a really good chance that they're going to, to be good. So moving on to the business world. Um, well, the business world, the environment which most of us sort of work in, and whoops, backwards. Yeah, the the business world is is just as ruthless and is just as dynamic as the natural world. Um, but the problem is, and I use Microsoft as an example, and you know, we, as I said, we, we've all got our own examples. Um, the problem is, is that brands and organisations aren't actually very good having sex. Um, they're actually sort of paralysed by fear. I mean, can any of you imagine a brand or a big organisation actually say, you know what, that seemed to be a really dumb idea. That didn't work. That's a really bad gene in inverted commas. Oh, I tell you what, though, let's keep it and then let's see if it works in the future or if we can sort of recombine it with something else. People just don't do that. If it doesn't work, and there's a huge fear of anything not working in any case. If it doesn't work, it's like, God, let's get rid of it. Let's, let's ditch it. So they have this paralysis. They don't do anything. And then, and we know, again, any number of examples of this, all of a sudden they realise, oh my God, look, somebody's doing, oh, we've got to change. We've got to change now. And they think, oh God, let's go out there. Let's try and have sex. But because I haven't done it for very long, well, for, for very recently, they can't do it. They have to get the Viagra. But then they discover that the pharmacy is closed. And so they're, they're completely stuffed. So, so what brands need is this sort of agile sex. It really is about doing it little and often. <clears throat> they just need to keep making changes. You just need to keep sort of shaking up your DNA, keep mixing it up not just sort of having this huge planning process. So you don't need, as you're very often told, let's have big innovation. Let's do something which is going to be disruptive. No, you just keep making all these changes all the time. 
Um, and then you'll find that actually you're going to be competitive all the time because you're doing it all the time. You're not sort of having these sort of moments of sort of stasis. So it's doing it a little and often. Um, now, Google and Amazon just do this. That's exactly what they do all the time. They're doing something, they're pushing it out, they're seeing whether it works or not. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When it doesn't work, you get all the media sort of saying, oh, look at that, it doesn't work. Oh, what a disaster, they don't know what they're doing. Google couldn't care less. Because all they're doing is saying, look, we think it might work, we don't know, we're going to push it out there, we're going to see what happens. Um, we get some learning behind it in any case. And if it works, great, and we're going to constantly sort of improve it. If it doesn't, well, so what? Because we're already pushing other stuff out there. And in any case, and we've seen this uh, you know, in terms of the way that they do that. In any case, if it doesn't work, we have got that learning, and there may be something there that we can reapply later and to do it in something else. They just don't care. So it's the entrenched players um, who have run out of ideas all the time. They have this fear of, of, of failure. They really don't want to do something if they don't think that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be right. So what happens? Everybody sits around the table, they do lots of research, there's lots of KPIs sort of set up, and then they go through this really long process. So what does that mean? It costs money. So the size of the prize has to be bigger. And so therefore that creates even more paralysis. Because it's like, oh my god, this is getting more and more expensive. So therefore in terms of ROI, we're going to have to achieve that. Oh, we don't know. Oh, and this isn't going to work. And look, we're not getting very good results and so on and so forth in our research. So we can't move forward. So it's the new players who are going to come into the marketplace and make something change. And I'm now just going to finish off. Oh, just have to... Quick. Right. One minute. Is that all right? I'll go through this. So kids and money. Here's an example. Actually, George Osborne said something the other day which I agreed with that the big banks need to have more competition. They need to have people coming in and breaking down the high street monopoly of the big four. It's amazingly said that, not of course he's going to do anything to encourage that, but children and money is something where little players like these are going to come in, they're going to nibble away. Um, Join Sam is one of them. It's the first um, digital money box where children online can save money, they can earn money, and they can learn about money. Whoops. Less than 12 months ago, it was just a twinkle in somebody's eye. There was nothing there. Now, um, February, so 11 months later, it's actually been launched. Whoops. This was the first iteration of it. This is what it looks like now. Now, any sort of well-established marketeer would say, look, you can't do that. You can't go from that to that. You've changed your brand. You've changed the whole look. And this is even in less than 12 months. You must be mad. But no, that's the old way of thinking. What you've got to do is just keep doing, keep going forward, get in your pop-up store. Look at that. All those wonderful merchants there are all signed up already. You can learn. It's on Facebook. It's on Twitter. And what they're not going to do, and this is my final, my final slide, is this is a, a, a quote from Sartre saying that life develops in spirals. And I don't believe, I don't agree with this. And what happens is that you just pass through the same points time after time after time. But at every point, you've got different levels of, levels of integration and different levels of complexity. In other words, you, go, you do the same thing, but it becomes more complex. It's like getting married many, many times, and each time you get married, as everybody knows, it actually just gets worse and far more worse. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so learn your lesson from Sartre in any case, because in some things he's right, but actually what you want to do is just move on. Thank you very much. <laughs>